Call the meeting to order for Thursday, August 25th, 2016. Uh, first item on our agenda is uh, consider approving the minutes from the August 11th regular meeting. Does any commissioner have any comments or questions on those minutes? If not, we will consider them passed as they have been done. Next item on the agenda is the financial statement. Chair calls on Mr. Kim Rupp. Thank you. This is financial summaries of the revenue and expenditure activities for the City of Hayes, month ended July 31, 2016. Revenues in July totaled 2618061 That's an increase of 234411 compared to the same time last year. Some notable areas of increased revenue, federal and state grants for airport improvement fund were up 156897 That's due to proceeds received from grants in connection with the runway rehab and snow removal equipment. Court costs and fines for public safety revenue were up 13453 Storm water fees were up 18210 due to the combination of July having the quarter collection, quarterly collection in it, but also as a result of an accounting process change. These fees were normally reflected with an adjusting journal entry, which was 30 days in arrears. Now, our accounting software is able to post this fee to the revenue when it is billed rather than a manual entry as noted above. This change does make it more timely. When comparing to this time last year, residential and business water consumption are down a total of minus 13%. That makes water revenue flat and conservation revenue down to minus 23% and sewer revenue up 27.5%. Year to date, total water consumption is off minus 7%. Total water total year to date water revenue is up 3.84 percent. Some notable areas of revenue decrease: transit guest tax was off 8,637. This is the first decrease in over a year. Much of this decrease is the permanent closure of one motel and the temporary closure of another. Year to date, transit guest tax is up 85,000. Expenditures in July totaled 2,205,879. That's a decrease of 109,687 as compared to 2015. There were no significant increases in expenditures when compared to this period last year. Some areas of decreased expenditure. Health insurance was down 147,000 due to the Aetna premium being paid in August of this year. Finance professional services fell 24,600 due to the timing of the payments for the audit this time last year. And insurance and surety bonds expenditures in the intergovernmental account were down 207,000 due to the billing for the city's insurance package renewal. Month to date, general fund sales tax collections were at 628,853. That's a decrease of $7,096 as compared to last year. Nine of the last 12 months experienced a notable decrease in sales tax receipts, totaling a negative 262,752, or a negative 3.71%. Year-to-date general fund collections are at 4,146,434. That's down to negative 190,387, or minus 3.39% as compared to this time last year. The report of quarter-to-date sales tax collections by industry <coughs> classification was down negative 57,196, or minus 3%. <coughs> Those top 10 now represent 70.8% of the total quarter-to-date sales tax distribution. Finally, the Finance City Clerk's Office invested one and a half million of maturing and renewing certificates with a weighted average interest rate of 0.69 percent. The portfolio certificate of deposit on July 31, 2016 totaled 56 million with a weighted average interest rate of 0.56 percent, which is up 0.3 percent from a year ago. The total balance of the money market account on July 31, 2016 was one million with a current yield of 0.2 and total investments are up 150,000 when compared to this time last year. I move that we approve the July financial report. Second. From the motion and second for approval of the financial report. Does anybody have any questions for Mr. Ruth? It was a good report. Although I'd like to see the sales tax come out. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Next item on the Could agenda is citizen call for the vote, Mayor, Pardon me? <laughs> call for the vote, please, Mayor. Sorry. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, say nay. Motion carries 5-0. Next item, citizen comment. Any member of the audience would like to address the commission on non-agenda items, please step forward. Your name. Seeing none, 
Uh, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Items for approval by the commission are some mayoral appointments uh, for the Building Trades Board and the Hayes Public Library. I would move that we approve the consent agendas presented. A second. Motion and a second for the approval of the consent agenda. All those in favor of that motion, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. That motion carries 5-0. Move on to, uh, there's no unfinished business. Move on to new business. The Oak Street Waterline uh, Project, awarding of the bid. Floor is yours, sir. Uh, Johnny O'Connor, Director of Utilities. Good evening. <clears throat> Tonight we're going to be talking about our Oak Street uh, award a bid for replacement of the water line. Uh, the bids have been received uh, for the replacement of the city water main along Oak Street from 20th to 26th. The low bidder is J. Cora Hayes. Bid documents were structured with the base bid for the water line replacement and the pavement repairs necessary for the water line work. An alternate bid was requested for additional pavement work to replace the other areas of failed concrete on Oak Street. J. Cora's base bid price is $363,607.50 with an alternate bid of $81,110 for a total cost of $444,777.50. Staff recommends authorizing the city manager in to enter into a contract with J. Cora in the amount of $44,777.50 to be funded from the Water and Sewer Capital Reserve and Special Highway Fund. <clears throat> the existing four inch water main along Oak Street from 20th to 26th Street is more than 60 years old and it does not pro uh, pro provide adequate fire protection and has a history of leaks. The Oak Street Project D on the map shown was first identified in the city uh, CIP for the 2013 budget along with various other locations in the older parts of the city for water line replacement. Call Valley Engineering designed the project in 2013, but we've had the plans on the shelf. Phase one of the 2013 plan was completed in 2014 and phase two in 2015. And now we are presenting to you Oak Street, which is a phase three of the plan. The Oak Street project will in install a new eight inch PVC water line to replace <coughs> the old four inch line replacing 22 existing services with all new taps, meters, and setters and service lines. And it will replace three existing fire hydrants and add three additional fire hydrants for a total of six. City staff advertised the project in July, on July 11th and opened bids on August 2nd of this year. Bids were received from two contractors, APAC and J Corp, both of Kansas. The bid documents were structured so that the base bid included all water line work and pavement replacement necessary to complete the water line upgrade. An alternate bid included additional pavement work to replace the other areas of failed pavement on Oak Street because replacing the additional street panels is important to street maintenance but not related to the main water line replacement. Staff proposes to pay for that work out of the special highway fund. <coughs> JCOR indicated that they would begin work in mid-October and complete the project within 90 working days, which basically means working through the winter as weather allows. A public information meeting will be held prior to work starting to provide adjacent residents the opportunity to learn more about the project and to ask questions. Your options uh, tonight are accept the low bid from JCOR for both the base bid and the alternate bid, accept the low bid from JCOR for the base bid only, or provide alternate directions to city staff. City staff is recommending accepting the low bid from J Corps for both the base bid and the alternate bid. We're asking you to authorize the city manager to enter into a contract with J Corps in the amount of $444,777.50 for both the base bid and the alternate bid. The base bid amount of $363,667.50 to be paid out of the water capital and alternate bid amount of $81,110 to be funded out of the special highway. Mr. Chairman, I move to authorize city manager enter into a contract with J Corp the amount of $444,777.50 for both the base bid and the <coughs> alternate bid. The base bid of $363,667.50 paid out of water capital. The alternate <coughs> bid of $81,110 be funded out of special highway funds. Second. We have a motion and a second for approval of awarding the bid 
to J Corp for replacement of the city water mains on Oak Street and 20th, 26th Street. Uh, was that 90 days in that uh, their completion uh, guesstimate was 90 days? Was that part of the bid specs that they that job has to be done in that amount of time, or did they just? That's uh, what they told us the bid that the job could be done in. Okay. Both APAC and J Corp said 90 days. Now, it says in there it's going to be using an 8-inch PVC line. That's not your PVC I'm going to go down to Home Depot and pick up, right? No, it's, uh, it's, it's right. American Water Works standard uh, C900 uh, PVC pipe. To right, play. yeah. So this is, I mean, heavy people duty. are, yeah, yeah, because people, are, I think, are used to seeing, this is actually a better long-term solution yes. than a metal pipe. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a specific type of pipe that we can use for, for water and sewer for, for that matter. Right. And as we discussed last week, this isn't going to disrupt water service no. to those homes that are fed off this line because you guys will That's I correct. You said, be putting in the line first before you switch over the taps, correct? Yeah, the, the, the regular service will still in, uh, remain in effect. We'll enter, uh, put in the new line, get that all done and get <coughs> that ready to go. Uh, they'll have the taps and all that ready to go and then we'll do the tie-in. So it'll be a brief brief amount of time that they'll actually be without water. But so are they going to kind of do the water line and then go back and do those panels that are a part of that yes. alternate bid? So that'll be, they're not going to do the alternate panels at this over the 90 days that they're also doing the water line? Uh, I believe they're going to be doing it all at once. Yeah, One and they're going to do it all at the same time. So when they get when they get the water line in, they'll do all the concrete work all at the same, same time. They'll, I mean, they'll do one, one half and then they'll do that's actually the, the easiest other. part. The hardest part is laying the line, getting the taps, and putting the new meter cans in. Yeah. And that's not the actual technical term. That is the hard part. Concrete's easy. So replacing this, you know, will stop the leaks we've been having. Does this help with the water pressure down in that area? Or yeah, that you'll, you'll have more volume, more flow, and, and it'll... Uh, the, the <coughs> biggest concern going to the 8 inch is adequate fire flow protection. So right. we'll be able to get volume in the area. Uh, so yeah, they should see improved pressure. And of all the projects that you had up there, this is the last of all of those projects from the 2013 CIP that's yes. left to be completed, right? So that's we'll correct. have completed that after this project. <coughs> that's correct. No further questions? Thank you. Uh, on the motion to approve the uh, waterline project, uh, awarding the bid to J Corp. All those in favor of that motion, please say aye. 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 That motion carries 5-0. Thanks, Johnny. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next item on our agenda tonight is the adoption of the Unified Development Code, otherwise known as the UDC, and also the revised zoning map. Chair recognizes Mr. Rohr. Good evening, Commissioners. Jesse Rohr, Planning Inspection Enforcement Superintendent. <coughs> well, thanks for your time tonight. This next agenda item is one that I and many, many others have been working on diligently over the last few years and hope to have it come to fruition tonight. Not that I've been counting, but approximately two years, four months, one day, and six hours ago, <laughs> <laughs> we actually held our first kickoff meeting for this project, which is the rewrite of the zoning and subdivision regulations. No less than six months prior to that time, we were preparing the project RFP and beginning the selection project process for the consultant that we ended up picking. That all started in late 2013. <clears throat> City staff along with Brett Keast and his staff from Kendi Keast Collaborative, a planning consulting firm from Sugarland, Texas, have been working on the Unified Development Code, or what you'll hear called the UDC here tonight, ever since that time. So in a moment I'll turn this over to Mr. Keast. He'll speak on the UDC and then I'll come up and speak again on the revised zoning map and wrap up the presentation. Feel free to ask any questions along the way. Uh, with any luck, in about an hour and a half, we'll have you out of here. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Brett Keast. Thank you for that <coughs> one minute, 10 second intro. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that means I have to speak for an hour and 28 minutes. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, Mayor and Commission members, pleased to be back with you. Um, before I start into the, uh, the presentation, I just like to say that this project has uh, gone as expected. Um, there's always tosses and turns along the way and answering questions and, and, and making changes. Uh, but your staff, uh, all the staff, uh, Jesse in particular, has, has absolutely worked diligently 
and uh, we've done this 125 times and no project has gone smoother than this in terms of our work back and forth with staff uh, Jesse knows this code inside and out better than I do and I wrote it <laughs> uh, he, he has really picked up on everything and that's very much appreciated it doesn't happen in all in all cases uh, we have worked for a couple of years now we've gone through multiple multiple meetings um, uh, Jesse has met with folks locally without us we've been here a dozen times every time we've come we've had open door meetings got a planning commission um, all the way through this process <clears throat> as a result we got about well Jesse gave me about 470 comments uh, we gave written responses to every one of those we made changes um, this ordinance is not perfect nor will it ever be um, but I can say that this ordinance is, this UDC is as close to perfect as it's going to be at this time because of all the work all the meetings with your realtors uh, developers property owners planning commission um, you've really done this project right in terms of, of reaching out and making every opportunity to folks to be involved in this process <clears throat> and if you know there will be changes um, and so if there's something that doesn't suit you change it it's as simple as that um, so this isn't etched in stone by any stretch of the imagination it needs to be a fluid document it needs to be a working document and there will simply be things that Jesse and I have read over 50 times and we've talked about and it looks great to us and then the project comes in and it's not what we had envisioned so we'll change it the beauty of this is is that with the software that I've talked about before you'll have your own access to make make changes to that document uh, so he can bring a text change to you uh, you can approve that text change he can go back to his office and click the button twice and it's live on the web and available for all your folks in the community to see uh, so that process will be very very efficient so what I like to do is just uh, go through the presentation some of this you've seen before so I won't bore you with it uh, but we have added some new things based on uh, what we understood uh, were some some questions use that one right here okay <laughs> it happens every single <laughs> time. There we go. Should I just click that? There we go. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Um, so basically, just want to <coughs> once again introduce this to you. Basically, includes all your development-related regulations. I won't. I won't cover all those. Um, so tonight we're here to talk about adoption. The one thing that is um, new that was recently delivered to staff is a development guidebook. Uh, this is something entirely new for the community. Um, your developers and folks who go through this process will find this very handy. It describes every single process. It describes the individual process, who considers it, who reviews it, who makes recommendations, who adopts it. It includes all new applications. Uh, so you have a lot of new applications. You have checklists. Uh, so in terms of staff intaking applications and making sure that they're all complete and for applicants who are making applications to have all the checklists and and uh, all new applications that reflect your code now uh, so that's been delivered um, uh, we will make this available online all the applications will be PDF fill in the blank so they'll be able to click and type their name and file their applications and we'll talk to you a little bit later about some of the add-on things that you can do with that to allow people to actually submit their applications electronically online. Um, so we're here, been through this process as Jesse described, uh, with starting with kind of analyzing and, and outlining the code and then drafting the code through three different modules. Had a consolidated draft earlier this year, uh, our planning commission public hearing, we met with you last month, as you recall. Uh, for the workshop um, so th this intent of this whole process it started as zoning and subdivision regulations and we transitioned into a unified development code and we brought in your stormwater and your floodplain and uh, other other related ordinances so it's all together in in one book now um, so you have a single source of standards definitions will be much easier to work with and provides many benefits for those who deal with it from the outside and certainly for your staff uh, dealing with it in terms of administering it on the inside. <laughs> All 
already. What happened there, Jesse? We have advanced technology. It's, it's the best that Radio Shack had to offer. Yes. Uh, Maybe put All that, right. Could you put the mouse down on the? There you go. Okay. I don't know if that has anything. I'll to just do with click it, that. I think that'll be easier. I have, I have a feeling it's getting clicked out of the. So who who will be affected? As I told you before, ninety percent of the residents of this community have no need to look at this document. Will never look at this document, and may not be directly affected by this document. Uh, the only people who will be involved in this are those who are in the business that are your engineers, your realtors, your brokers, your developers, what have you. And as I'll talk about, if somebody wants to make an improvement to their house, um, we've greatly simplified that process as well. Uh, so primarily applied to new development. I'll talk to you a little bit more about what we're doing for established neighborhoods. And then of course, everything's grandfathered. So nobody's knocking on their door tomorrow, telling them they gotta do something different than what they've always done. The only time this will kick in is if they come in for a building permit or go through the process for zoning or, or something of that nature. Um, so we've made it a lot more predictable, new, uh, more, more certain. Um, so the code has had more words because it's more articulate. Um, so we can put it in black and white what the expectations are so they don't have to guess at what everybody may be thinking or what may be required of them. Uh, fewer discretionary approvals, more administrative approvals. We've almost cut the number of districts in half. We haven't lost anything. Uh, we've gained a lot, um, but we've done that in the way of having options within the districts that are permitted by right. Uh, so fewer zoning districts means fewer zone changes, fewer planning push meetings, fewer council meetings, less time, less expense. Um, so those who are used to going through that process will be tickled pink <laughs> if they don't have to go through it nearly as often. Um, streamlined approvals. Um, Jesse told me today, sorry if I'm taking your presentation, Jesse. I'm proud of this, that uh, he went back over the last couple of years and looked at the variances. He had 15 variances. Half of those would not have been variances under the new code. Um, so that's, that's good news, and primarily on the residential side. And that's frustrating if you try to sell a house and you got to go through and get a variance and go through public hearing and be delayed. So we've tried to uh, eliminate that. Um, we've added a new category called limited uses, whereas people may have before had to go through a public hearing and get a special use, they can now get a limited use which has standards written in black and white in the code, tells them exactly what they have to do. If they do those things, they can be approved by staff. Uh, those are all spelled out in, in the code, and we've gone through them and through them and through them. Um, and it's a lot more, lot more flexible. Um, so it's not one size fits all, um, but it, it can accommodate more, more flexibility. We've done a lot of things in Hayes because we know that you know, we're not a, a bustling economy and, and, and cost is a concern. So we wanna be careful that we're We've done so many things that will actually reduce costs, um, either operational costs, development costs, uh, or just physical design and improvement costs um, with reduction of, of parking and ways to reduce parking and reduce concrete. Um, that's a major expense in development. Um, Non-conforming thresholds where we can step in improvements that are commensurate with the actual improvement themselves rather than saying, oh, you added on five stars foot, so therefore we're gonna hit you with all these regulations. That's not the intent. We wanna kind of have them in a sliding scale so we can help people improve their property and do business and increase the tax value of their property in this community. Um, we talked about fewer zoning districts. We added three new ones. We'll talk to you about neighborhood conservation. Uh, Jesse will show you how that's applied on the ground. We've got a new mixed use district. Um, before, if somebody wanted to come in and do commercial on the front, residential back, they would zone the front half commercial and the back half residential. It's not necessary. It's an extra step that's unnecessary. So now we have a mixed use district that will accommodate that type of use or a vertical mixed use building. So somebody wants to build a shop and live above, um, they can do that in this mixed, mixed use district. Currently all you really had was your central business district, but anything outside of that would have to go through a PUD process, which is demanding, and so it's really not necessary. Before you go too far on that, yes. um, but if I go to an area that's not mixed use now, yeah. what process do they go through? So, well, let's, let's take in two steps. Okay. So if they go to a area that's not mixed use now, currently, without ever thinking about this UDC, um, if it's zoned 
commercial and residential, then they may be good to go. Well, but more it's, more it's, than likely, that's not the case. Right. So they're going to have to go through the zoning process. Okay. And what has happened in town is they have created, they've had to come in and submit an application to change something from, say, ag to commercial, right. and then something from ag to residential, and all their surveying and all the mapping and mm -hmm. everything that goes along with that, go through planning commission, go through council. Um, the difference here would be that they still are going to have to do a zone change if it's ag, say, to mixed use. But they can accommodate those uses with one single district, which gives them a lot more flexibility of the types of uses they can do within that. And now your zoning map is going to have one big district rather than two. Some of your neighborhoods, uh, one in particular that we looked at, has four zoning districts because it has different size lots. They're all single family. Uh, or there's some, I think there's some duplexes, but they have four zoning districts and what this code will allow them to have one zoning district. So it just greatly simplifies your zoning map. It simplifies its less cost. You know, they don't have to have all that laid <coughs> out to make application. Um, so I think that'll be a big coup for okay. Thank development you. in this community. Um, and your land uses, you've always had permitted and special and prohibited. We've now added the limited, as I told you about. Uh, we've taken a look at all your uses. The code is outdated, um, so there are a lot of uses that just don't make sense anymore. So we've consolidated those, added new new ones. We have language in there for those that we may not understand what they are and that where they would fit into the, into the code. And every single definition is defined. So if you want to know what the difference is between a modular home and a manufactured home, you just hover over it on the lawn. And it'll give you the definition right there. Um, and then we've spelled out all the limited special use standards. So if you want to open a daycare, or a veterinary clinic or something like that, and it says an L on the table, you can go to it and say, these are the things we're concerned about, whether it's setbacks or buffering or access or parking or what have you. If they demonstrate to staff how they meet that, go to business. We're not gonna hang you up through 90 days through public hearings and advertisements and notice and uh, et cetera. So this is an example of the use table. So all your uses are now in one single table. All your Uses are down the side. You notice they're blue. That's because they're all definitions. So if online, just hover over it, and it'll tell you what a live work unit is. If there's any other standards associated with that, we, you click that, and it'll take you right to those right to those standards. So anything that's a, a L has other standards. So you click on that, and it'll take you right to the uh, section that you need to need to go to. Get my cursor over there again. Where did my cursor go? There it is. Uh, this is an example of your limited and special uses. So if you want to do alcohol sales, it tells you where it can be, any, if there's any design standards and any other standards, or animal boarding, veterinary services for large or small animals, it tells you all the, all the standards and things we're concerned about in terms of compatibility and uh, trucks or trailers or anything that might be, might be coming in with that. Established neighborhoods. Now this is something I want you to all understand. Um, we could have created these new zoning districts and just put zoned all your current neighborhoods everywhere that you guys live with a new zoning district. What that would have done would have made you all non-conforming because the new districts have different setbacks and different lot sizes. Your homes weren't built to that standard. So that means maybe if you want to sell your home, your mortgage company may say, wait a minute, <clears throat> you know, you don't meet the local zoning and you need to go get all these variances before you can sell your home because we want it clean with the city before we take this transaction. Instead of doing that, we said, we're inheriting those homes that were built in a period under different circumstances and different regulations. So we essentially want to lock those regulations in. Uh, and then we're going to say that all those things, if they were built lawfully, they got a permit, and they built everything, they are conforming, they're not non-conforming. Why is that important? If there's a, a vacant home and somebody wants to go get a mortgage, uh, if that lot is non-conforming, they're going to have a difficult time getting a mortgage. and may have to pay cash. If they have to do that, they're probably not going to build it, and that property is going to sit vacant and overgrown with weeds and not on the tax rolls. So it's important that those are considered conforming, conforming properties because they were legally or lawfully built. Now, if somebody wants to add on a master bathroom or a family room or something of that nature, currently they have to go through a variance uh, because it may be encroaching into a rear setback or a side setback or something of that nature. What this code does is says, okay, we want people to reinvest in those homes. We want those homes to maintain viable 
Uh, so we're going to give them some wiggle room and we're going to allow them to do that. We're going to write it into the code and say, hey, if you want to encroach in the backyard a certain distance, just show us how you're going to do it and we can approve it administratively. Uh, we're not going to let you build to the property line. We're not going to let you shed all your water on your neighbor's property. So we're cognizant of, of those things. But this is where those 50% of the variances go, go away because uh, we can approve them administratively. And that's necessary in a lot of these, these older neighborhoods. And it's all to, also to preserve the character. Now, this photo is not from Hayes, uh, but this is the type of thing that we're concerned about is if a house burns down or a house is raised for some reason, there's a foundation there, uh, and somebody wants to build back on that foundation, they should be able to build back on that foundation. I'm working in another community right now, and they're saying, nope, you've got to meet the current standards. Well, every other house on this block is set back 20 feet. Sorry, you got to set back 35 feet now. But it's a small lot. Well, that's the standards. And you got to build 100% brick. Well, no, 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 houses are built brick. So it just makes no sense. So we're trying to preserve the character of that neighborhood when everybody invested and, and bought into when they went into that neighborhood and to put some reason on, on things. So that's the whole purpose of this neighborhood conservation. Uh, so when you see the zoning map that Jess will show you, we didn't rezone these areas, we simply are redesignating them. So if you were zoned you know, something before, you might be zoned NC1 or NC2 now. The standards remain the same, it's just a different letter designation. So if you get any questions about that, you know, we want to make sure that everybody knows that all the setbacks, the lot size and everything have been carried through, so you've not lost nothing, what you've gained in terms of all this flexibility and less process. So there's a description of the different neighborhood conservation districts. So if you were zoned R3 before, you're now NC.3. Um, if you're zoned R1 or R2, you're now NC.2. And then there's tables in there that basically carry those lot sizes and setbacks and everything through. So if you look at a, an area of town, you think about what's unique about this area in terms of the homes, the lot sizes, their setbacks, or separation between the homes. Those standards are all carried through and we're trying to preserve that so you don't get one oddball kind of upsets the apple cart and gets everybody in the neighborhood stirred up because they're building something that just doesn't fit. Then we have new neighborhoods. Now this is where some of your changes are. Basically we've carried all your current standards through but they're not in all separate districts now. So that guy is talking about that has four zoning districts for one neighborhood. You now already have one district and you can do different housing types within that one district and not have to go through the zoning uh, process. So if you want to have some duplexes or some townhomes or something of that nature, you can do that. Uh, you can buffer between them. Uh, we have provisions in there. There is, is an option for option or for average size lots instead of minimum size lots. So if somebody wants to mix and match some lots within reason, uh, having some 50 or 55 foot wide lots or 60 foot wide lots, etc., cetera, um, they're able to do that. So therefore you get some different floor footprints. You have some different housing types and different prices of housings in, in the same neighborhoods uh, so it can help with affordability as well uh, and then your non-residential districts uh, we've got a landscape surface ratio which was basically the unpaved areas that's that's in there as well so that's an example of the, of the standards that tells you <coughs> uh, lot sizes uh, and open space percentage and then the density so we built in bonus bonuses nobody's required to do any one of these it's purely the developers option but we've spelled out the standard so they come into a residential suburban district they've got three options all of them are permitted by right they just need to tell us which one they want to do depending on what they see the market being and what they think is the best and most profitable for them and we've spelled out all the standards in terms of the housing types and the dimensions and everything so this is an example of a planned development the only one in town uh, around your golf course, we've got single family homes and you've got a mix of other homes. This could all be done in a single district. Would not have to be a PUD, would not have to go through that whole process. Uh, it could be done through straight zoning. Another, another location where we've got an apartment right across the street. Um, if it's single family and duplex next to one another, we're not too concerned, but if it's apartments next to single family, there are buffer yard requirements. So if that's your backyard or your side yard, it will uh, be required to be buffered. And then all your different um, setbacks and heights and things of that nature, which is what's in your current ordinance, but they're tied back to those different options. So this is the neighborhood we're talking about. Uh, it's got four different zoning districts. Um, 
and that could be one <coughs> one zoning group for today. So it would be much simpler, much less time, much less cost, um, and, and have the same results on the ground at the end of the day. Your parking standards, uh, carry them all through. Every use they have in the in the ordinance now has a parking requirement. Um, so you can see what's required for parking. We did make that a parking floor area, which is 85% of the gross floor area. That's to, most of your businesses when you drive by and the parking lots are empty, right? Except for Black Friday and maybe another day out of the year. It's a lot of pavement, it's a lot of expense, and so we tried to lower it down so we can make parking more reasonable. So that was a pretty substantial uh, savings in development costs when you're paving parking lots. And we're, st we're not gonna have any parking problems. Uh, we've, we've modeled that. Access, just thinking about how we take access to streets and making sure that we're making them safe and uh, preserving the traffic carrying capacity and speeds on roadways that are designed to carry that. So here's an example where all the homes are turned to the side, the driveways are on the local streets rather than, than what is uh, intended to carry traffic farther distances across the street and at higher speeds. And then you sign regulations. Uh, we were part way through this when the Supreme Court case came out out of Arizona that uh, made every sign code in the United States unconstitutional with very few exceptions because if you have signs for grand openings or construction signs or real estate signs, you have to read the sign to know that it's a real estate sign or a construction sign. You can't do that any longer. So we had to go back through your ordinance and start tweaking and changing, particularly your temporary signs. Um, so we spelled out all the different sign types, whether they're attached to a building or detached, their heights, their sizes. We've addressed how bright they can be, um, electronic message centers, uh, where they can be, how big they can be as a part of the part of the sign, uh, making sure that they're done tastefully but still allowed. Rhett, let me, I'm sorry yes. to interrupt you, but on this point alone, these people kind of paid for themselves and it, it's not, they can't take all the credit for it. But because of that case that came down, we were going to have to do something about our sign ordinance. I mean, there was no yeah. question we were going to have, we were either not going to have one or we were going to have to rewrite it. And, and it is happening in cities across the country. And uh, my fellow uh, municipal attorneys of uh, where there's where they're not getting a UDC have said, you know, this is really inefficient because we could be redoing the code at the same time. So we're, we're literally getting calls like every other day from clients and friends in the city saying, "Help us! You know, yeah. we got to redo our sign ordinance." Um, so yeah, it was it was actually good timing that it fell in the middle of this, and we were able to. It was already on a contract, so yep. we did a little extra work and, and took care of that. But there's been a lot of follow-up lawsuits because the word got out that cities are are uh, subject to easy suit. And so, and it requires strict scrutiny, so you're simply not going to win those cases because you can't, can't prove your point. Um, so this is the way the sign ordinance is structured, all the districts and different sign types and tells you when, where, how much, how tall, et cetera. So put them into, into tables. So example of a sign um, that would comply, its height, its size, um, concrete base, other sign uh, set back from the roadway, how it's illuminated, sizes, heights. Then this is the development guidebook that I was telling you about. So there's little um, uh, processes that show you for this process, here's the steps you go through, a different process, you go through different sets of steps. So I think you'll find that very useful. Uh, and just very quickly, there are some real opportunities. Uh, we've been visiting with some of your local realtors and brokers. Uh, we met with them on one of my recent trips and they saw, um, they saw some of the stuff that we're, yeah, pull back over. that we're able to do. And I think they immediately saw the value in it. And so we're, talk to them and figure out how we might be able to coordinate between the city and uh, the Board of Realtors. Um, get my mouse back over there. <coughs> Where is it at? <coughs> you want to run through Yeah, this? I was going to make it bigger. Yep. Okay. I'll change the size real quick. I'm just going to take a couple minutes here. I'm not going to take too long, but this is a, a sample. So for instance, uh, you, you can go to the code, you can see, you can view the code online, you can look at 
you know all different parts of your parts of your code. Um, so you can read through your code. Uh, you see, we can have have tables in there, all the pop up definitions. Pull up individual definitions in a separate box, or we can just hover over the top of them and see what they <coughs> are. Um, for changes for staff, if they see a change and they want to keep track of that, they can enter a password uh, and then put in their comment and it'll keep a tally for them. So as different staff members are looking at it and you see changes are identified, it'll keep a list for you. We can put all your tables into uh, in the back so they're quick and easy to find so you don't have to dig through to find what the parking requirements are or what uh, residential standards are, non-residential standards, etc. The, uh, the, the, what the realtor saw was a land use lookup um, that allows somebody to come onto the site. They may be sitting in Kansas City or St. Louis or Houston and they want to open something here. Say they want to open a deli. And they can search for that. It says a deli falls under these two land use categories. Here's all the zoning districts that a deli is permitted in. And then you click on this link and it'll tie in your zoning map. This one is from Redmond, Washington, home of Microsoft. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll show you all the places in the community where you can open or build a deli. And then what caught their attention was these are all the properties that are for lease and these are all the properties that are for sale. And if you click on one of these, you can actually pull up picture of it and go more information and actually pull up so um, listing agent and the price and everything else so this is your price proprietary software it's it's our software that's licensed already and has been for two years to the city of Hayes how long is our license uh, it was initially done for a period of three years and then it's annually renewable after that what's well, the cost of annual renewal uh, four thousand two hundred fifty bucks annually and is it capped is there a rate at which you cannot exceed uh, there is a license agreement that depending upon the features that you choose it sets so if you go up to the next uh, feature set it's called the advanced 180 it goes up a thousand dollars a year and if you go up to advance uh, to the premium 360 which would include all these things here it goes up two thousand more dollars but for that you get all the all the support um, you can get all the mapping features included we can do all your application receipt so developers can submit their plans right. their applications use PayPal to pay their fees and do everything without ever having to come to City Hall well, I guess my question so, uh, it's lost I apologize yeah. there is a product in the pharmaceutical industry called EpiPen and it went from a nominal amount to $500 so is my question was is there a cap on the four thousand dollars yes or okay great yes so i want to know we haven't raised our fees since we've been in business okay and all of our contracts it usually will put in there that it can't increase by any certain percent in any uh, one year uh, so this is the business that i'm in i'm a planner we write right. this you guys are my friends and my clients and so that would serve me no purpose to try to you know, well, I'm not accusing you of that because I didn't know no, that I this know. was yeah, yours very good question. Or, or if you were representing someone else. So that was my question. Thank you. And we also have um, a software escrow, which would make City of Hayes the uh, beneficiary so that it gives you the comfort of knowing that ENCODE could go nowhere and you own the software. You get the code yeah. if right. that happens. And it's it's held in Denver, Colorado yep. with your name on it. You can look yeah. at it anytime. Anytime we update it, we update that. It's in a in a secure climate controlled uh, uh, folder for you and uh, just gives you that, that piece of knowing that it's you know nothing's going to happen to it just out of curiosity where are you pulling that lease and for sale data from is that would that be pulled from like our local MLS yeah uh, when we're working in Kansas City and stuff there's national vendors that work in the major metropolitan areas and we're able to work with them to get that but uh, yeah, I guess that's why I'm asking. Who puts it in? Yeah, there. That's, that's my question. Who puts area. the data in there? That's what we were talking to them about. The Board of Realtors works with a, uh, a group that ma manages that. I imagine all the realtors and brokers are providing they are. data and photos and all that type of stuff. Um, Is so it compatible with your site? 
I'm sorry? You bet. Yeah. So, so the, the, okay. We can map by address, by latitude, longitude, um, or a number of different number of different ways. So we're able to basically import that data and display it. Hmm. So um, we're talking, they're actually talking with the Board of Realtors. We're going to set up a, a WebEx with them. And they're talking about maybe seeing if they can get a grant from the National Board of, Board of Realtors. National, National Association. National Association. Hmm. Um, so, but this it's really designed to make the code as easy as possible for anybody to, to use. Um, it's an example of the application upload where the applicant can go in and fill in their property information, profile information, etc. So, I talked with Toby earlier today. We said we just wanted to give you a heads up. Uh, the way it was built, you're at the base base level. Good. Um, you, you can, you don't have to. You can add at any time. You can add individual features, or you can go to the whole next one. Um, very, very flexible. But just wanted to. That's great. Make you aware of, of what's available. And Muni Municipal Code Corporation is your codifier. You've been with for years. We're an exclusive partner with them, so we can communicate and work with them. So. Um, Go back to all the chief figure that. <laughs> so this is just all the different uh, procedures, and you've got applications for each of them um, so these are all the ones that can be approved administratively those that go before a public meeting or a public hearing many of those that you recognize today same process uh, then your subdivision approvals as well um, same process as what you have today but you just have new uh, new applications and better description of how that process works are we going to entertain questions about the UDC or are we doing them all together or how is this how do you want to proceed However you prefer, prefer well, to I'm rely on the chair. I'd say ask whatever you want. Okay. Uh, I was curious <coughs> what you were just showing up there, you know, staff versus uh, the administrative hearing or whatever. Because like, when I was reading through it, I talked about the zoning administrator, but and, and it's possible that I missed it, but I didn't see who that was or how that's determined. Is that something that's appointed by the city manager and that's I just correct. missed that? That's correct. Okay. Yeah, if you go to the definitions and it will say, it may say uh, uh, Jesse's position or as appointed by the city manager okay. or designee. Yeah. And then the other question that I had um, was, and I forget whatever chapter this is. Well, anyway, I think it's chapter 10 or 11 where it was talking about the makeup of the planning commission because um, it said, uh, I think it said three or four people from the out from you know in the extra territorial jurisdiction has it always been that, that I thought that it was a specific number but this changes it to where it's kind of like an either or do you know Jesse so? I think you can help on this but the it came from our uh, from the when, previous right when we first established ourselves as an independent non-joint uh, land use control Entity. But we, in the process of that, we negotiated with the county, and one of the things that we negotiated was how to handle the makeup of the planning commission itself. Mm -hmm. And he's right, and I believe that carries straight across from how it's handled currently to the new code. There's no changes, oh, okay. and it wouldn't it would dictate any changes unless either request by the county or the city. Okay, I guess that was I, I guess that was my question was whether it was a change or not because every not. time we talk about the current makeup, I I hear different numbers thrown out. Which members are from the extra ter territorial jurisdiction and which are from inside the corporate limits? So whatever it, it said, like it whatever varies. it did say, it says now, and I think it did have flexibility did, on okay. the number. Okay, it's no more than. Yeah, I think it's a uh, no less than and no more than, and I think there is a. a Possibility of three or four. Okay. So a lot all of right. things like that that are the same today as they were before. They moved over. Okay. 
I've got a couple quick questions for you. You talked about the forms now being online, so you can go on there and submit them. I'm assuming that you can still, for uh, computer illiterate people, you can print oh, them yeah. off or you can run down to the planning and get hard copies to fill out there. Absolutely. I would see that this will be probably in the front of Jesse's office. Anybody can come in and fill them out by hand if they want to. Um, <coughs> so make it however anybody wants to fill them out will be available for them. And the, these next two questions are... You kind of answered them, but is this present code, is it easier for me as a homeowner to um, build a garage or add on to my porch or uh, do a driveway? Is it easier with this code or harder or the same as the previous c the code we're currently using? In, in some ways, it may be the same. But where it's different is what I was talking about the neighborhood conservation. That if you did want to enclose a porch, or if you did want to um, add on or something like that, that may be within the parameters that are spelled out in the code that would allow you to skip the variance process and just demonstrate how that's going to happen. And it's spelled out in the code what what you can do in terms of front, interior, corner side, and rear yard setbacks. Um, and so that's where the uh, fifty percent of the variances that went away um, so that will save what three months and a lot of heartache and headache so it'll it'll be simpler um, in terms of a driveway I don't know that there's probably going to be any changes from what there is there is today so you haven't gained or lost anything there but you're going to gain on that neighborhood conservation provision and I think you also answered my last question but it's the same as the previous question, but it's for new construction. Say I want to sell my house and go build a new house. <coughs> As a homeowner, for me to go buy a lot and build a house on it, is it easier, harder, or the same for me to do that now on this code or the pre or the code we're currently yeah, using? That, that will be the same. There won't be anything that's uh, certainly nothing that's more difficult. Um, if, if your house were, let's say, a house were to burn down, uh, in the established area, it would be a lot simpler to rebuild that house today than what it would have been before. Okay, thank you. And the other thing, I'll try to keep interrupting, but it's easier from the point of view that they've made it more, I'll call it user friendly. I know it looks, to me, it looked more complicated because it's a different way than I'm used to doing things. But I also do things on the computer, and I, as I was watching, I realized. Hell, they're just doing the same thing that I wish I could do at the office, mm -hmm. and they're putting in, putting on a lot of desks is what it amounts to. So some homeowners will be able to do the things you, he was just showing you right. without having to come to the city, without uh, having to contact an attorney or whatever. They'll just they'll be able to read it themselves. So it's easier from that point of view. What not necessarily it doesn't give them a huge number of different. We didn't change the way. Th neighborhoods fit together and some of those kind of things or the setbacks are still sensible they make sense we're not gonna let them build up buildings up against each other and that kind of thing it didn't get easier that way but it's probably easier to use I think if somebody's doing land developments it's gonna be much easier much less process much less time and much less expense so. well and and like I said you'd answered a couple of them questions before why you was going through your presentation I just wanted to get that point out there across it I think that the for me the importance of this is that to make it simpler for somebody like myself that doesn't do this a lot but I have gone down got a permit to do stuff and and um, I just don't want to make it a harder process for somebody that's already um, not comfortable with that process we wrote, we wrote the code in Sioux City, Iowa, and their site plans were taking six weeks to get approved. Now they take nine days after the code was done. So that's substantial, cutting that in, in third. The question I have, Commissioner Jones, you kind of asked this already, but do we have, Jesse, very many developers now that prefer it not online to do development and stuff like that? If you have new developers in town or wanting to build a building, I mean, do you have many that would rather have a piece of paper or would rather do it online? You know, I think we're starting to see some of, we're, we're kind of heading towards that trend. Our, our permitting software that we use, our permitting and building inspection contractor licensing software, we're just now getting there to the, cap it now has the capability of doing online permits. Uh, we're not 
tied in with that system yet, uh, but um, staff went to their annual conference this uh, couple weeks ago, learned of their, their new development. We've talked to contractors, and on that side of things, they're, they're seeing that appealing. A lot of them don't like to take even 10 minutes to stop what they're doing on the other side of town and come down to the office and take another 10 minutes for a permit. So I've been doing uh, uh, residential permits online for with Linda for probably two years. I can't remember last time I went down there. Right, yeah, there's some, some contractors, just like the mayor. They'll come, they'll sit at their desk, they'll fill out the, a permit, email it in. It's paid through credit card and done that way. So, so we are starting to see that now on the development side. Of course, it's a lot different process. Right. And I think with the ease of, of things that we have here, I think we'll start seeing that trend as well. Well, that's the thing that really stood out to me. You know, I just wrote some notes. You said multiple times it's more flexible, should reduce cost, um, and affordability. You know, that's the biggest thing we hear all the time. Well, you guys pass this and you're driving up costs. And I hope that's not what we're doing. I don't see that we're doing that, but. You know, I don't do this for a living, development and stuff yeah. like that. So that that's a concern of mine. Yeah. Well, there's, um, it's give and take, I guess. Right. You know, we, we figure that if we up the standards in one place, but we reduce the standards in another, that we can have a net gain. Sure. So, for instance, there's more landscaping requirements now than what you've had. So if, if somebody is just re required to add some shrubs, they may not like that. Right. But if they're building a building and they have to put in uh, six less parking spaces and all the concrete and all the prep, mm -hmm. they'll have a smile on their face because a few shrubs versus that is a drop in the bucket. Right. So that's where we try to really be conscientious that you know we're trying to keep it reasonable. Um, so I, I think I feel good that we've accomplished that. Well, and, you know, I was here during the meetings I guess last year when a lot you know it was filled in here and they asked a lot of questions to you, Jesse. And I've had many people tell me that they feel like you listen, you try to adjust the best you can. And I think that's that's big for our community. So I appreciate what you've done with that. I know it's been a tough couple of years. So. May I know? Yes. Thank you. So again, I've got to piggyback on uh, what Vice Mayor Musil said. I know that we've gone through a long process and I appreciate the work that, that you've done and staff have done and you've really condensed down the rewrite of it to nominal amount, and the city manager has also looked at it a lot. And I'm sure that an electronic version is a little easier to read. But uh, I took a look at it, and uh, there are a couple areas that, that really were confusing, and then I d the answer still is a little bit confusing to me. And the first was on accessory buildings, which I'm just going to leave that because I don't understand this writing at all. And the second was about fences. And my thing is, it says that in residential districts, uh, that and it has the height requirements and so forth, then on the next page, or you scroll, and it has a little picture. So, I, you know, I know a couple people that live on a corner and have tall fences, and if we wanted to replace them, I didn't know what that would be. So that's page 315 and 316 for the... The, the tree killers. Um, but then I was told that no, there's something else that supersedes this. And so if an individual did live on a corner lot and their backyard, even though it was on the street, uh, it would not be a 42 inch tall fence. By the way, it's three and a half feet. So basically your dog's could, little dog couldn't get out. But you could go to the full six feet. But yet, I don't see that anywhere in here. So, could someone explain that to me? Um, generally, the thought is with respect to site visibility. Okay. Uh, in front. Um, so, particularly on a corner lot, when you've got streets on two sides, uh, we would not want... So, here's one example. This would be a greenfield development. Someone comes in with 40, 50, 60, 100 acres and wants to develop, develop it as residential. But then this particular one, You'll see different, different shades, uh, different colors. You'll see yellow single family, red or townhomes, or some dark red, that's some re uh, residential mixed use. And the plan here would be to develop a large portion of open land into housing. The UDC over, when compared to current code, provides more options as Mr. Keith described. There's more types of housing within the same zoning district. So you could do single family attached and or detached housing triplexes and townhouses all within the RG district I just showed a minute ago. 
You can also do the mixture of the lot sizes. That's where Brett talked about the lot averaging. The current code requires a strict minimum lot size and lot frontage. Our current code within the process about minimum lot size, and they are just minimums like we have now. If someone wants larger lots, they can do larger lot development. We have options for both standard, <coughs> what's called standard development and plan development. This will be a type of plan development right here. We have the different housing types available. As we started the UDC process two years ago, one thing we want to do is come up with goals of the project. <coughs> Excuse me. This project meets two of those stated goals. It uses urban services and infrastructure efficiently when we see this type of development. And it also creates housing opportunities and choices. So scenario two, the plan here under this scenario, this hypothetical plan, would be to tear down a row of homes and or commercial buildings that may be dilapidated and no longer the best and highest use of the property. Along an existing downtown or near downtown arterial and develop a mix of ground floor restaurant or retail with upper lofts and or some multifamily residential even at ground floor. Commissioner Measle touched on that a, minute, a few minutes ago when he talked about what's the process to do that. If it's not zoned appropriately it would be the applicant would request a rezoning to the C3 or the mixed use district. I do want to know again that mixed use is a district we currently don't have. We don't have that option currently. We would with the new UDC. The UDC would allow for these types of uses with no special use permit required within the C3 and mixed use district. Currently, if you want to do ground floor residential within a C3 or mixed use, you'd have to go for a special use permit. And again, I talked about those goals. This, this type of development would meet the goals of encouraging human scale design in a major activity center and encourage and facilitate mixed land uses. And then my last scenario here, <coughs> And on the slide, you'll see I just picked a, a random residential lot in the what I what we, we would consider the older part of town. This is a 50 by 125 lot or a 6,250 uh, 6, square foot lot, which is very typical <coughs> of that part of town. If someone wanted to purchase a small house on a small lot in an area like this, which would be considered a neighborhood conservation district, in this case, I believe NC3, and add on additional living space and a detached garage or tear down and build new, there's options available to do that that aren't available now. The UDC has several advantages. Brett talked about the setback averaging. In this case, utilizing the, the average setbacks for the other homes along the block, this home would be set approximately 20 foot from the front property line. Under standard residential, under current code, that home would be set 25 feet back. So they gain five feet in the front and would not have to come before the board for a variance to line it up with the front of the other homes, which they have to now. There's probably over the last five years, we've probably seen four or five variances for that very thing where someone wanted to tear something down and build a house or a duplex, but they couldn't build it to the front of the rest of the block because of our current regulations. This, under this scenario, they would not have to go to the board zoning and the public hearing process to be able to do that. With those extra setbacks, a couple examples here, someone, someone could, could construct a 2,000 square foot house or duplex and still have 55 foot of rear yard available for a detached garage or open space. They could also, there's room to add on to the side of this house. There's also, as I talked about the front yard averaging, there's also side yard averaging. Uh, so you can get closer than the standard residential general uh, district would allow. And I know Brett already mentioned, but I'll, I got a note here, so I'll mention it again. Like I say, I was kind of shocked this morning when I did some digging and over the last, um, over 2015 and 16, we had 15 variance requests and seven of those would not have come to the Board of Zoning under the UDC as they did in current code. So right, just about half of them. Um, that's all I have on the zoning map and the wrap up for UDC. So. We would entertain any other questions, either for myself or Brett. Questions? How many uh, pieces of property were did you examine that were rezoned during that 1988 review process? That we're gonna oh, gosh, it's, I, I would say 
10 or 12 potentially. Okay. Did your motion include the map when you made that? Yes. Okay. Does any audience member like to comment on uh, either the UDC or what is on the map? Please Please recognize Mr. Williams. <coughs> I'm Doug Williams here representing the Hayes Board of Realtors and uh, I'll keep it brief because it's getting late uh, with a late start. Uh, many of you may know that the Hayes Board of Realtors initially uh, strongly opposed this uh, rezoning effort and subdivision effort and uh, for, for a lot of valid reasons. Uh, fear for one, none of us like change, none of us like being told what we can and can't do. But there were also some pretty onerous uh, parts of it that we felt would be very negative and we were concerned that there would be a loss of property rights, increase the cost of the development and thus cost of construction and an increase in the cost of government. And I can't say that those fears have been totally alleviated, but I do think Jesse and Brett and John and, and Greg and, and everybody involved with Toby have worked very hard and eliminating the pieces of it that were the worst and uh, I think probably 95% of them are out of there and uh, you know a, a large part of it was also due to ignorance and if you know realtors there's no lack of that amongst that community <laughs> but, uh, uh, it, it takes a while to get into the middle of this thing and understand what really applies and what doesn't mm -hmm. you know the neighborhood conservation part of it uh, in the initial reading didn't really understand that they were really leaving the neighborhood, the existing neighborhoods alone. You know, thought all these new rules were going to apply to everything and how could anybody ever do anything. And, and uh, so uh, once you get to understand it, you realize it's not quite as uh, difficult as it might be. That being said, uh, you know, we do still have some concerns, but at this point, and I, I won't use the line that we need to pass it to see what's in it. <laughs> But I, I think that it maybe needs to be passed so that the rest of it can be vetted out and figure out what the bad parts are. Uh, some concerns we still have, it, it puts a lot of authority in the zoning administrator. That would be Jesse. I have no issue with that as long as it's Jesse because I know people can get along with him fine. But if it's not Jesse, what happens? Mm. And uh, so those are some concerns. There is an appeal process, I assume, that you can take it to the Planning Commission if you don't like the results you get from the Zoning Administrator. So, uh, so long as there's those processes involved, uh, I think we're pretty comfortable with it. So, just wanted to go in the, on the record as saying that uh, we have come a long way. I think they've done a good job, and it's, it's probably time. So, thank you. I really appreciate your yeah. comments. One of the things that I noticed, too, in there was that there is more authority put into the zoning administrator which is why I asked about that you know who is that and who sets that but I was kind of alleviated with that when I started reading through the appeals process uh, and that ultimately there is recourse for somebody who thinks that maybe they haven't been treated in a fair right. manner so but you can take it to a higher court right I appreciate your comments very much thank, thank you yes. thank, thank you, very you. Much. I, I would uh, like to also mention that I appreciate it when you came to the uh, Planning Commission and actually made similar remarks uh, you know after having you know looked it over and, and also after the changes were made and I also would uh, I don't know if this will alleviate any fears that you might have but uh, you know the uh, the old document you know got tweaked and amended many times and I look at this as the same thing uh, I'm like you I don't want to say just pass it see what happens because I think for the most part it, it's going to work but obviously Building trends change, uh, housing needs change, a lot of different things change. So, you know, over the years, we're going to see some uh, various tweaking of this, and I'm certain you'll probably be involved in that as well. They're so, never done. They're always evolutionary, and so... Uh, well, yeah, exactly. Uh, Commissioner Schwaller mentioned, you know, some building materials uh, might be uh, in vogue at, at some point in time and not at another. So, you know, things change, and, uh, and that's... Uh, I'm glad you're willing to accept a little bit of change, <laughs> or I should say reluctantly. Even with all this gray hair, I can still accept a little bit of change. <laughs> Did this UDC cause that? Exactly. Had <laughs> you guys are responsible. Yeah, 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 these guys. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Any further comments? All in favor of the uh, adoption of the uh, Unified Development Code and the revised zoning map, uh, 
please respond by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. That motion carries 5-0. Next item is progress report. Chair recognizes Jake Wood. Hmm. Assistant City Manager Jacob Wood. I know this is the uh, part of the meeting you've all been waiting for, so uh, I'll try and fly through this because my kids are in bed, so I don't have to go through that ritual. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, watch this, you wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Start out with the utilities department. We had a couple of repair projects go on this month. We had a water main break at the 100, the 100 block of West 25th Street. Uh, we had a digester mixer at the wastewater treatment plant go down that we had to repair, and then we have a discharge pipe at the sports complex lift station that we repaired. And I just want to make note, um, we're in the hole here and we've got trench safety equipment here and it, we're going down in, in a 30 foot hole and we're, we're tied off and we've got fans going. Um, so we're really focused on safety in, in these uh, instances. We could uh, certainly fix things a lot quicker if we didn't follow those safety requirements, but, uh, but we always do. So I just want to make note of that. Um, utilities department sent uh, several people to KDHE operator school. Um, we sent about six people. We had three that actually took uh, certification tests. Um, Johnny O'Connor passed the class four water test. Lance Corner passed the class one. And then uh, Jason Regal passed the class four wastewater test. So congratulations to those guys. They're uh, a little bit uh, more certified than they were uh, before they went in there. I'm in the public works department, the uh, airport snow broom that was uh, approved by the city commission um, in the spring has arrived. You can see... Just uh, in time for fall. Just, just in time. <laughs> so it probably won't snow, um, it but it's here. Yeah. And you can see it's a, it's a pretty large machine. You see the uh, yeah. guy standing there. It's a lot bigger than what we had um, in the past. Also in the public works department, uh, we have a uh, salt storage building. This is an in-house project that we've been working on uh, throughout the summer. Uh, the guys just uh, got the, uh, um, the supports on the top, and they actually put the canvas uh, on top earlier today. I don't have a picture of that, but it's uh, completely finished. In the Parks Department, uh, at Sunrise Park, we have a turf display area. Um, there's several different kinds of warm season, low water grass that are on display. We had two new types of grass that were uh, just installed um, in the last couple weeks. One of those is called Latitude 36 Bermuda, and the other one is Patriot Bermuda. The, uh, the whole point of this uh, turf display is to have a place where people can go and look at the turf and see what it looks like so they might be able to maybe pick one and put it in their yard and have a, a lower, lower water grass um, to conserve water in the long run. Um, at Kiwanis Park, uh, there's now a uh, Frisbee golf practice area. This was an Eagle Scout project. Uh, Connor Tiggett um, had an idea to have a uh, practice range at this park, so we went to the Parks Department. He raised some money, and they put in two tee boxes and six baskets there at Kiwanis Park. They're all spread out at different, uh, different distances, so you can go out there and practice um, your Frisbee golf. The uh, Hayes Police Department National Night Out on August uh, 2nd. Uh, we, the Hayes Police Department invited uh, everybody out to the swimming pool uh, for the National Night Out. They provided hot dogs and hamburgers. Um, they had a very good turnout. Several hundred people showed up. I uh, just want to thank uh, the following sponsors for this event. We had the Fraternal Order of Police, um, Hayes Lodge 48. We had Pepsi, uh, Crawford Supply, Phase 2, Walmart, uh, Eagle Communications, and the Hayes Rec Commission. On to the fire department. They had a busy month of training. Uh, did high angle rescue training at Fort Hayes State Campus. They did some driver refreshing, uh, refresher training. They also did some joint training with uh, Ellis County Fire District Number no. Five, um, and we did some hazardous materials training. Uh, this is actually at the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, this is a chlorine tank. They did uh, did some hazardous materials um, training with chlorine. Uh, had a simulated chlorine leak, so they went through that, and then. Uh, at Lincoln School, they had a new playground dedication, and the Hayes Fire Dog um, was there along with A-Shift to, to be part of that dedication. And that's all I have for tonight. Do you have any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Good. Report from the city manager. I have nothing to add. Councilman? Nothing. Mr. Jones? The uh, Court of Campus parade with the three uh, higher education institutes tonight, uh, Hayes Academy, Hair Design, uh, NCK, and 4A State. That's a, a great event put on by um, Downtown Hayes Development Corporation and, and 
cooperation with them three uh, institutes and just a fun event for the new new college students coming on to campus and I really appreciated the invite and was glad to be a part of it. I also wanted to congratulate uh, Coach Frank Leo and the Larks for being national runners up in the NBC World Series and it's unfortunate that it was a one and done game but uh, that's the way it is. Um, we'll get them next year. <clears throat> also enjoyed the Guard Campus. Nice to see a wide variety, a larger crowd than usual. And I appreciate the mayor's brief yet complete remarks. You represented us well. Thank you. And for those that have nothing to do, and it's very boring here, tomorrow night is the Fall Gallery Walk. If you are not a fan of art, there, a cruise night is at the Ace Hardware. So if you want to see beautiful cars or beautiful art, Tomorrow night is your night. It's a busy weekend. Mr. Meyer? I have nothing further to add to that. I have a question for the City Commission tonight. Um, with my newfound duties here in a couple weeks, I was wondering if you guys would be okay with um, Mr. Meyer uh, replacing me on the Ellis County Coalition uh, representing the City Commission. As Groucho Mark said, if they'll have him, that's his own problem. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing greatly. Perfect. <laughs> I have no issues. I was thinking we'd all want to think about this for a week. Oh, no, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> He's a perfect fit. That's a good group. Right. Thanks, guys. Uh, well, with that, uh, my, uh, my term on the uh, library board, part of the reason for this is my term on the library board will end, or it did end, I should say. I won't be part of the uh, September meeting, and, I, and the mayor, incoming mayor, will have to assume that duty. And it'll be... Uh, Pretty interesting because uh, one of the things we had to do due to the resignation of the uh, former uh, library director was to hire a new library, new library director, James Agee. He'll come on board uh, September 1st. And at some point, uh, I, I don't know the date exactly, but uh, there'll be a reception for him at the library. So, nothing else coming for the uh, commission. I will adjourn the meeting.